Hey there, folks, and welcome to another update on the geologic situation in Iceland. I am geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Today is Friday, May 23rd, and it's been several weeks since I did any update on Iceland. Was finishing up the semester, took students down to a geology conference in northern Utah, uh, but I'm back now. I uh, actually will be in Iceland. I leave in two days to go to Iceland. We'll have a couple days there on my own, then I'm running a field trip. Uh, and from there, I'll head over to Switzerland in a couple weeks uh, in the Alps. So I just wanted to put together this update, let you know what's going on. And let's go ahead and check out the latest here. So our latest update from the Met Office, um, it's pretty much business as usual. Uplift is continuing, very minor earthquake activity going on on the Reykjanes Peninsula. We have had some earthquakes in other parts of Iceland, and I'll touch on those briefly here in a second. But the uplift continues, and of course the uplift around Svartsengi is believed to be interpreted to uh, being due to magma inflation and magma migration into the shallow subsurface. That's causing the ground to rise and bulge. I'll show you the, the GPS data and some of the INSAR data here in a little bit. And so based on the, the trend of the uplift and what we've seen with past eruptions and intrusive events here, it's looking like best estimates maybe, we're not gonna probably see another event, whether that's an intrusion or an eruption, till probably pretty late in the summer, maybe going into fall a little bit here. And so that this Met Office update uh, reflects a lot of that. So the rate of uplift is going on, but it's um, not nearly as fast as it was at other times. Um, and so it's looking like it's gonna be kind of a, you know, several more weeks, months, really, until we get to that next event. So a fairly brief update from the Met Office, uh, basically the same hazard map that we've seen previously. Let's go ahead and look at the earthquakes in Iceland. Uh, just the last 24 hours, you can see how quiet it's been on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Again, it's just a 24-hour period, so a very limited uh, set of data. But you can see just a few earthquakes here north of Grindavik. Um, up here towards uh, Hagafelt. Again, these are all small quakes, less than one magnitude. If we look at earthquakes over the past two weeks, um, we'll start here on the Reykjanes and then we'll look at some other parts of, of Iceland. A few offshore here on the Reykjanes Ridge. Uh, and then you can see a pretty nice distribution of very small quakes over the last two weeks, delineating that dike or that intrusive body that exists here from just north of Grindavik up through this is the main re region where we saw a lot of the eruptions taking place and now we know after april the april 1st event that that intrusion extends a little bit further to the north so just a, a scattering of earthquakes in here none of which are particularly large 1.6 that may be about the biggest one in the whole sequence let's see what that one is there yeah 1.6 so too small for people to feel uh, but nonetheless earthquakes happening as this area is dynamically shifting and changing, more magma is intruding, uh, stress is being exerted on these rocks. And so we would expect these earthquakes to still go on at fairly low levels until we get closer to later in the summer and get to some sort of threshold where we have the magma completely filling that storage zone. And now it's starting to push on adjacent rocks, exerting stress and starting to break rocks. Then we might see the earthquake activity pick up a little bit. Uh, we did have some earthquakes in other parts of Iceland. There were some large earthquakes here off to the north. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes just talking about these. These are off the north coast of Iceland, just uh, east of this island here, Grimsey. Um, and you can see the distribution of these quakes, the largest of which was about a five. I think there was actually a few bigger than that or so. We'll have to see here in a second. The USGS did pick up some of these these bigger quakes here, but you can see the distribution of these. There's there's a, a, a north-south trend a bit here. There's also maybe, it's a little uh, scant, but maybe a little bit of a trend going this way. That actually jives pretty well with the plate boundary. If we look at a, a plate boundary map um, of the area and look at what this area looks like, you can see, starting with this inset here from this publication, You've got the North Volcanic Zone, so this area here, um, just to the east of Akuyeri, um, Krafla, these other historic eruptions that have taken place here. This is the plate boundary moving off of Iceland's coast, and then it actually connects over here to another divergent boundary, a, a mid-ocean ridge where the plates are separating, and it's it's connected by this thing called the Churnus Fracture Zone. So there's a series of faults and um, 
fault systems in here that allow, accommodate this this motion. And so if we look back at um, those earthquakes there, those they're sort of following that same trend. Again, here's Grimsey. Here's all these earthquakes from the past two weeks. And again, just kind of looking here. So those earthquakes would plot up. Here's Grimsey here. Earthquakes would plot up here. Um, and then they would kind of go off into, there's a little bit of an orientation there. But you can see there's a, a lot of these um, normal faults. These are normal faults here. These lines with the little hash marks on them that have been mapped here across the seafloor. And again, the USGS did pick up a couple of these quakes, the bigger ones, over the past two weeks. So we've got, looks like a 4.7 and a 4.6. Uh, if we look at that largest one there and check it out, it does have a beach ball, a moment tensor solution or a fault plane solution uh, that shows us it's dominantly uh, north-south striking. So you can see these two curves going around here. So the, the fault plane is oriented in a north-south direction or mostly north-south direction. And because we have this area here that's white, this is a, a normal fault. So it's a little bit of strike slip component, uh, but dominantly a normal fault. And that's pretty much in line with what you would expect to see uh, along this zone here. So here's the plate boundary. Again, just, just simplify it, obviously, uh, and then kind of moving up to this ridge that extends off the north coast of Iceland. So some fun little earthquakes happening there off the coast of North Iceland, nothing to be alarmed with. Um, they'd have to be much larger to generate tsunami. There's not as much uh, infrastructure up here. So uh, likelihood of damage from these 4.7, 4.6, fives uh, is pretty low. Uh, so that's kind of what we have been seeing across Iceland in terms of earthquakes. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, and those earthquakes happen on May 12th and 13th, just to give you some context there. Let's go ahead and look at the GPS data. And let's go down here to the rake in this area. We'll start with uh, Svartsengi, which is the, graph that we tend to look at the most. Uh, and you can see here the pattern of uplift at this GPS station near the power plant um, since February. So the, the trend was moving up. It was inflating slowly. Uplift was happening. And that all reached a climax on April 1st when we had a, a minor eruption and a, a bigger intrusion. So some of the magma left the storage system moved off to the east, filled and found space within the rocks to inject that magma, moving it out of the storage zone into this other uh, body of magma. And then some of that actually leaked out and formed that small eruption that lasted you know, just a few hours or so on April 1st, just north of Gurindavik. And so you can see that after that event, since the magma had withdrawn and moved out of the system, uh, the GPS station dropped in elevation deflated and since that time it's been inflating a little bit of a change in slope here you can see it was quite rapid inflation rates or uplift rates going through about mid-april and then since then uh, the slope has kind of leveled out a little bit here and so it kind of dips and swales you can kind of look at anything sort of on a scale level and see you know areas where it's much lower slope areas where it's a little bit steeper but you can overall see a, a lower trend there. So we're essentially now here as we get into late May, uh, more or less, um, you know, if we look at that measurement there, it's about the same as here. So we're kind of at the same point now as we were in late February earlier this year. And so with that um, trend, we had to get all the way through uh, another month, essentially March before the event occurred. So, you know, maybe looking at July, or maybe more into August before we're really kind of, the system is primed, if you will, for that next event. But anything can happen, it's dynamic. There's lots of variables at play. Um, if you really think about it, there's just, it's pretty amazing we're able to, to monitor this level of detail and data compared to you know 50, 60 years ago, but still there's so many things we, we just can't measure and so many variables that aren't really recorded that we still have to take into account, but we don't have a good handle on. And so hence there's, quite a bit of uncertainty uh, with these eruptions and these events as they as they unfold. Uh, so that's our GPS data. Um, all the other stations show very similar trends um, with, you know, uplift that's kind of slowing, was much more rapid in the days after that April 1st event, but has been slowing since. If we look at, there's some nice INSAR images that have popped up over the last few weeks. So here's the Terrasar X one here, and you can see that bullseye pattern 
just to the west of the Blue Lagoon power plant area. So this is from May 6th to 17th, showing the uplift there. Um, and maybe scroll down and find, there's another one from the Cosmos SkyMed satellite from late April to May 16th. You can see the count the number of fringes there if you want to. And for the Cosmo satellite, each little color band is about 1.5 centimeters of uplift. So it looks like kind of going from this green blue to that green blue to that green blue, that would give us um, three bands. So maybe four and a half centimeters, something like that of uplift during that interval. Um, another one here, different, uh, same satellite, but different period of time. So you can see the color fringes there, just some very nice colorful uh, INSAR images that show us that the uplift is still going on on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Uh, interestingly, there's, you can see that the, the location, if you see the center of the bullseye, it's a little different here than, and that's actually pretty similar, but it's a little different than what you might see over here. And I don't think that's any, you know, there's, I don't think there's anything to read into that. If you think of just this thing inflating like a balloon, there might be weaknesses in the rock that cause it to bulge slightly one side or the other at any given time. I don't think the center of the bullseye is indicative of the location of the next eruptive event because we know we have this well-established pathway uh, conduit from this magma storage zone, which is you know not just right here in the center of this bullseye, but more broad uh, off to the east and into this dike and intrusive uh, series that has been formed since late 2023 so there's no reason to believe that an eruption is going to take place uh, in any other location what we would expect to look for uh, going into the next event would be the earthquakes we would expect to see and the and the ground deformation but the location of the next eruption if it were to be in any other new location we'd expect that magma to, would need to break rock, establish a pathway out to the surface, and we just haven't seen that so far. So until we see that data coming in, uh, we would assume that the most likely eruption would be in the locations we've seen the previous eruptions. Uh, a couple news items. Um, so there was a small, I mean, going back to these earthquakes here, uh, there was, it's hardly a swarm in my mind, but I, I suppose you could call it as such, but it was a small cluster of quakes sort of on the central part of that dike. So here again, Blue Lagoon power plant area here. Uh, here's uh, uh, Silingerfeld, this hill right here. And just to the east of that, there was maybe, I don't know how many dots you think there were there, maybe two dozen or so uh, quakes over a couple days. Um, maybe some would call that a swarm. Maybe, you know, it's just a small cluster. But nonetheless, it was a bit of a news item. Yeah, no signs of deformation after the earthquake swarm. Just, just a, a minor thing. Uh, they had, I guess, it looks like maybe they had 60 measured in less than an hour. Um, but they were all very small, and nothing really came of it there. So, just interesting thing there. And then finally, to wrap up this update, um, a news story about how they are starting to take a, a closer look and think about preparation for volcanic activity eventually making a bigger impact, not just on the Reykjanes Peninsula where it's been currently, but closer to the capital region and closer to uh, the urban areas there around Reykjavik. Um, and so they have a couple maps here that show just where uh, these lava flows from different systems have sort of a, a lava flow hazard map, if you will, for the Krishuvik system. So this this might be the areas inundated by flows there, to, just based on previous volcanic vents from that system. And you can see some of these flows do get into this uh, southwest area, southwest of Reykjavik, that's uh, highly populated. And then from the Brennesteinfjord system, um, you see the ex extent of the lava flows that could impact communities there. And so the article is mainly just you know thinking about what they might do, what the specific hazards are. Uh, I don't think it goes into any specifics yet, but it, it just suggests that their, you know, government officials are starting to take a, a close, hard look at what their future might be, given that the, the Reykjanes Peninsula now is volcanically active and has been for a year and a half or so. So that's my update for you, friends. Hopefully that 
works and finds you well. Uh, again, I'll be headed over to Iceland on Sunday. Um, I will try to do some videos while I'm there. Of course, if anything new happens with new data, if there's any notable change in what we've talked about here, I'll jump on with my little portable setup and provide you with some sort of update as best I can. So hope you're doing well. Thanks so much for your time and support of the channel and take care.